Welcome back to the channels Tapa Alho Azul and Super Academico. Let us keep the reading of my book Phenomena. Today we will read the chapter 17. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. Chapter 17 The desert, mountains, a river with almost no water in it. That sequence of geographical bodies alternated itself as we approached the center of the northern territory. We had to travel up to a city bathed by Lake Eyre and from there we'd take a car to the village of the Aborigines, which was bathed by the Eyre River and close to its nascent dash, right in the core of the Northern Territory. Although the view was amazing for a visitor like myself, looking at it for three hours in a row had got me very tired. All the other guys slept throughout the whole trip, even Carla did it. I wanted to talk to somebody. So, I decided I'd wake John up. John. John. What happened Joseph? Did we get there yet? No, not yet. I just wanted to talk to you. He rubbed his eyes. About what? About this territory. You're from here, aren't you? Yes, I am. I was born and raised in Nierier, the city where we'll land. And what do you know about the Aborigines? I never had a lot of contact with them. The few ones that live in the city remain within their communities. They seem normal. What do I know? They have their habits, their beliefs. When the Protestant church first got here, they tried to convert them, but that didn't work out. Some missionaries said they were sorcerers, wizards that had magic powers, but nobody ever proved anything. They are also very closed within their culture. I don't blame them. When we, the white men, first got here, we mistreated them a lot. That's right. I know that history very well. Only in another case scenario. Are you talking about the Native Americans? I made a confirming gesture with my head. Like every younger generation that's being born in the world, we felt guilty for the mistakes made by our ancestors and we always thought that in order to change that we just had to take an opposite action. Too bad that as most people get older, they seem to think that's the responsibility of the next generation. It ends up being a vicious cycle that never ends or changes. Listen John. They didn't get us a car from World War II, did they? We both laughed. No. I asked my family to arrange everything on behalf of the university. They won't disappoint. That's okay. At that moment, the pilot informs us by radio that we'll start landing soon. I went back to my seat and I buckled up. One thing was still hammering in my head regarding the chat I had with John, if the aborigines really had telepathic powers. Telepathy is a proved extrasensorial perception, but would an entire race be able to possess it, perhaps it was genetic. I got curious, but certain things still scared me. And what if they really had that power? Everything the anthropologist said he saw could have been an illusion planted in his mind by the aborigines. I saw no reason for that. The questions popped into my head as the airplane proceeded with the landing. As soon as it hits the ground, I look out of the window. A lot different from the southern cities in this country, that dusty a village seemed to be redeemed by the presence of the lake. As soon as John saw the look in my eyes, he ran to rescue the image of his hometown. It is always like this when the water level of the river is low. As soon as it rises and the wind stops blowing, you can see the buildings and the larger constructions over there. It is not a big metropolis, but they live quite well here. I wasn't sure if I'd feel relived with that confession or not. Actually, I couldn't care less. It was just a step closer to our final goal. Anyhow, I exaggerated a little when I said a village. John's father was waiting for us in a station wagon. We would spend the night in the city and leave in the following towards the Aborigine community. John said that one of the local Aborigines would come along with us. We needed him to introduce him to the tribe and he needed a ride. However, before we went on with our journey, we would have dinner with John's family. In a way, observing the behavior of a family is always interesting. We got to house of the abbots, John's family. I think could unmistakably say they belong in the Australian middle class. The car we were going to use was there. And John was right, it was a good and brand new car. We decided to pack everything before resting. Two small siblings of John helped. It seemed a normal family atmosphere. We everybody got hungry and tired. Even the endless smile on Carla's face was fading out. This had been the easiest stage of our journey, and we were dead tired. I tried not to think on what would be forthcoming. Only one thing cheered me up, the closeness of the Abbott family. I could not help thinking of my own family. I had only sent them a letter addressed to everyone. I just hoped they were all well. 
dinner went by very smoothly. The pulled two tables together, one near the other, in order to squeeze everyone in, John's father, Francis Abbott, took a seat at one of the ends of the table. His wife, Marlene, was very quiet and polite. John's sixteen-year-old sister, Annette, couldn't get her eyes off of Bob, our physicist. His two younger brothers, Harold and Francis Jr., who wouldn't stop fighting one another, and, of course, the eight of us. We were all tired, but we went through that protocol with lots of goodwill. Dad, did Kanega call to confirm the departure? Yes, he called this morning. He said that we'll be waiting for you by the entrance of the ferry tomorrow at 7 a.m. Right. He gives a fast glance at me, indicating that everything was under control. How is his voice, Dad? Mr. Abbott can't contain his smile. Improving. I think. Then John addresses everyone. It's just that he moved here when he was only 14 years old and his English carries a very funny accent. Joseph, you, by being American, will notice an incredible difference between our accent and his. Everybody smiles subtly. Then, Mr. Abbott said. Things are not so easy in your country lately, are they, kid? Out of that question only the term a kid bothered me. I gave him a short answer to that. We're surviving, I noticed that nobody talked about our work during dinner. I was not sure if they were simply ignoring the subject, like I used to do back home, or if they just didn't want to talk about it at the time. I noticed an incredible concentration in that family, togetherness, even John, despite living so far away, fit right in. I think that's why the professional conflict that most families experience was not part of that family's context. Their closeness surpassed all different paths. We finished dinner and went to the guest's room. Carla was melting in my arms out of being so tired. They were 10 p.m. and everyone wanted to hit the sack. Even so, we all had coffee with the Abbots. The other folks were shooting the breeze while John and his dad were still talking about the arrangements for the following day. And what fuel, dad? Does it have enough? Don't you worry, son. Kanega calculated the distance to be traveled very accurately. There are some extra gallons in the car and the tank is full. Everything will certainly be okay. The way they talked to each other made me feel a little envious. I never was that close to my dad. I tried to be happy for John. Carla was sleeping in my arms, so I said, Excuse me, but where are the bedrooms? Everybody looked at me. John got completely blushed. Only after a few seconds I realized what I had done. I had to try to undo that. It is for Carla. She cannot stand still any longer. Still a little embarrassed, Mr. Abbott asked his wife to show me to the girl's bedroom. So I said, Angela, take her, please. I didn't want to make the situation even worse by taking her to the girl's bedroom. I looked at John. He seemed as he wanted to laugh, but was also somewhat embarrassed at the same time. I was still standing when I said, I will have another cup of coffee. I didn't really want it, but I had to get rid of all that attention. After all, there was one thing the Abbots really ignored, sex. They were close even in that respect. That explained John's shyness regarding his personal issues. All his family was very functional, but they wouldn't display a lot of emotions. Except for his sister who continued having a crush on Bob. It was breathtaking. Yet, when I remember that, I think it was very funny. Now, all I wanted was to go to bed and leave for our adventure in the morning. This encounter with the Abbots was real pleasant. That was our last real contact with civilization and I think we needed that. On the following morning we were on the highway. We crossed the city in order to take the ferry to cross the lake. It was more practical that way than to drive all around it and then proceed toward the north. It was not as big as the Great Lakes, but it was big enough, it was the largest one in Australia and we took a good half hour to cross it. Before catching it, we ran into Kanega, the aborigine who we would accompany us on the trip. He was going back to his tribe, our subject of study. He seemed normal. His accent was really curious though. He sounded as if he had learned English from a Chinese. The contractions were all done without the appropriate intonation. It is a difficult thing to describe. Kanega was dressed up in normal clothes and would talk about any subject. I didn't know a lot about the aborigines. I didn't know if civilization had affected his life, like we affected the lives of the Native Americans. I admit I was curious to see a primitive person and be able to make comparisons. Observing that people would be the doorway to the understanding of the phenomenon that we would study. Up to that moment, I had only had contact with Western spirits. 
I wanted to know up to what extent culture would affect the human soul after the body dies. The contact with the spiritual realm must work through such a subtle liaison between it and life that, due to its simplicity, it ends up escaping the reach of our eyes. I was sure about our feelings, but there was a lot more to be unmasked. We crossed the lake and got on the highway again. John said that we were going to drive on asphalt for a long time, before we have to face the dirt roads out on the dryness of that land. Fortunately, the Air River followed the road all the way into the tribe. That way we would always have water available, even though we'd go through many real empty spots. Despite all difficulties, the desert beauty of that region continued to enchant me. Only Kanega and I seemed to see the same things. We were both appreciating a familiar beauty, in his case, because he was going back home and that was something no one else had, nowhere in the world. It was sad to realize that one needed to go so far so to appreciate what had always been so close to him. I thought of my street back home. We finally got off the asphalted highway. It went all along the northern coastline, but we were bending a little towards the east, in order to arrive to the nascent of the river, where the aborigines lived. All throughout the journey, which lasted one and a half day altogether, John and Bob took turns behind the steering wheel. Besides, we only stopped for times to get gas and some supplies. We went by some small cities that managed to survive when the river was full. Yet, as we'd go past them, we'd only see this scenery of absolute devastation. I am not sure whether or not that was considered a pretty sight, but it did seem quite normal to all my trip companions. Maybe I was not used to seeing stuff like that. We stopped by this brook to stretch for a while. It seemed almost totally dry. There were also some leafless trees around us. Everybody seemed bored with that tiresome trip except for Kanega. He was as calm as can be. He'd always look around as if trying to listen to the sound of silence. I observed him and could not stop wondering whether that was a sign of telepathic powers or just the fact that he missed his tribe. I meant to ask him about it, but I didn't it. After all, civilization had indeed affected that people, at least that man, but in a different way. The further away he was from his community, the more he missed it. I could almost feel the satisfaction in his eyes for being back into that wild life, Mother Nature. Why would some people insist in despising it? I could hardly wait to see that man come into contact with his people again. It will probably be awesome. We could already spot a ring of smoke in the horizon. The tribe was nearby. Kanega discreetly cried a little. Bob was behind the wheel in that last stage of the trip. He jogged John, who was sleeping right in front of him at that very moment. Wake up, John. We've got to the last frontier. His joke, which referred back to Star Wars, seemed to have decreased the likelihood of a potential physical and limiting future. But I understood what he meant. John, still half asleep, looked at the horizon and, smiling, turned back and said, That's it. We got here without a scratch. It was not that hard, was it? Everybody laughed. I believe I was the only one who was feeling affected by that extreme heat. After all, I was from a temperate climate. Although, I never complained about it. I shared everyone's enthusiasm for reaching our goal. The first one to get out of the car was Kanega. Now, feeling free to cry, he ran into the arms of his family. Actually, the whole tribe gathered around him. From inside the car, I looked everywhere. I thought that some spirit would be there to share that with us, but there was none. Today I understand why. They had a very fulfilling life. Taking advantage of a simple moment like that didn't seem quite necessary for them. They'd already taken advantage of everything. Seeing that entire crowd gather around a son who returns home, I realized they were right. The other cultures value what outsiders more than they do their own. Yet they do not. They were happy for having a member of their community come back home, and that was more important than acting hospitable toward the eight of us, as we were used to. We silently watched that welcome celebration of Kanega's return for about ten minutes. I think everybody understood what I had felt. It was a good sign, because mutual understanding was a basic need for our so close and yet so long coexistence. I didn't get close enough to see it for sure, but I think everybody in the tribe cried for seeing Kanega again. By night we all knew where we were going to live. After being with Kanega, they helped us with our baggage and took us into a hut in the surroundings of the tribe. I think they understood the need for a separation in between cultures. Some of them who spoke English would quickly explain to us about certain local habits so that we wouldn't feel so lost during those first days. There would be a formal introduction that night and we'd ready to go shortly after we put all our stuff away. No room assignments, please. That was Angela. 
For a future psychologist, she was extremely narrow-minded. Don't worry, Angela. Time will sort everything out, John maintained his. Leadership tone. I don't mind sleeping with the boys. Said Carla. Who else? She made both John and I blush for different reasons and everybody laugh. We'd better get going now. The chief should be waiting for us. And I warn you, don't expect any banquet. The aborigines also suffer a lot when the water level of the river drops. John's toughness always came in waves. I think the more insecure he felt, the harder he seemed to act in order not to let it show. And off we went. We sat to the chief's right. Kanega was already there, all dressed up in native clothes. He seemed to feel a lot better that way. In a way, I understood why, the heat was extremely intense. The food was simple, but tasty. I didn't want to ask what it was. I was afraid that'd be considered an intercultural mistake, but I think it we ate kangaroo steaks. As for the drink, I have no idea what that could have been. The girls seemed to have been way more affected by that than the guys. After the meal, they organized a dance in the middle of the tribe, around the campfire. Kanega said that was their official welcome to the noble white sorcerers, the scientists. By the end of the celebration, we were all dead tired. It was interesting to start a relationship with such a different culture. Although I was tired, I was also excited. I didn't mean to tap into that subject just as yet, but I really wanted to ask about what happened to the anthropologist. Curiosity was moving all around the entire group, but John's practical way of handling things was also in his mind. Hey Joseph! What are we going to do regarding the hut? Now that we are getting ready to go to bed, that hit me. I meant to tell him to let nature run its course, but I didn't want to sound ironic before his apprehension. In fact, I think he was actually a virgin. We hang a sheet in between beds, like we saw in that movie with Clark Gamble, he looked at me in a very weird way. Either he found my idea stupid or he'd never seen that movie, but... Seriously, Joseph. John, everyone is dead tired. Do you really believe someone will actually think of something like that at this point? He got embarrassed again. All right then. But we'll have to sort that out tomorrow. His concern with such a silly issue was beginning to irritate me. We ended up sleeping altogether in sleeping bags and no one felt bothered by anything. I think everyone was already sleeping before lying down. They didn't even take their clothes off or said goodnight to anyone. Perhaps they'd been affected by that drink. That strange culture was surrounding us now. We had a mission to accomplish. And a brand new world awaited us for next five months. We will see what happens. I hope you have enjoyed this reading. Don't forget to subscribe to both channels and like and share the video. Bye.